Good evening. Thank you all that uh, are gathering. There's more people coming as we're uh, as we're speaking. Happy Veterans Day to every one of you. Thank you for joining us on this Veterans Day. Appreciate you spending an hour with us this afternoon as we focus on making a difference in the lives of those experiencing homelessness in Pierce County. Uh, for those of you that have been uh, on for a few minutes, you uh, heard some music and saw some inspiring words that uh, ended with a, with a really uh, impactful statement. Everyone deserves housing and we want that to be the focus for this next hour. We do have a great hour planned and I hope you'll gain a new understanding and a renewed commitment to help address the challenges of homelessness uh, while you're here with us throughout this meeting. Um, and then especially at the end of the hour, we're gonna provide you with an opportunity to invest in making a difference for our unhoused neighbors. But first, uh, to kick it off, it is my privilege to introduce the president of the Associated Ministries Board of Directors, Chris Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson joined our board six years ago, following a career as a research librarian and then organization leader for multiple research universities. In his several years at Pacific Lutheran University to conclude his career, he served as Chief Information Officer and Associate Provost for Information and Technology Services. So Chris, over to you for our official welcome as we kick things off. Thanks for the kind words, Mike. Much appreciated. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our annual gathering of our supporters. You know, normally we'd have about 350 people of, they come together in the same room and share a meal and renew our friendships, but we all know that this is a very different year. So we're undertaking our first ever series of online meetings that we're calling AM Focus Week. So welcome to AM's new normal. Associated Ministries, as many of you know, is an interfaith nonprofit organization that reflects the broad diversity of Tacoma's faith communities. For example, I'm a member of Tacoma Friends or Quakers, and I'm deeply connected with Peace Lutheran Church's affordable housing program. It's primarily my work through Peace, maintaining three houses that have been homes now to several families that had previously been homeless. That's my pathway of faith that brought me to working with the Associated Ministries Board of Directors. Others like you connect with AM and its mission in different ways, of course, but the common element in all our approaches to this challenge of homelessness in our community is compassion. All faith traditions, all people of goodwill share this core value of compassion. And so compassion is at the center of our program and our appeal to you this evening. Before beginning our formal presentation, though, we want to open this gathering with a devotional thought. And today we've asked the Reverend Dr. Eric Jackson to lead us. Dr. Jackson is a native of Alexandria, Louisiana. He was the founding pastor of the Greater Heights Christian Church in Georgia and later served as senior pastor at Schofield Barracks, Oahu, Hawaii, where he resided while serving a tour of duty with the Army. He spent 33 years in the military, retiring in June 2019 from service as an Army chaplain. He now lives in University Place with his wife and two sons, and most recently served as senior pastor at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Tacoma. Eric continues to serve on several local boards, including the Continuum of Care and the AM Board of Directors, where he's a past president. Thank you for opening our gathering this evening, Reverend Jackson, and for centering our time together today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. I uh, appreciate the intro. Um, it's always humbling to hear, hear that, um, but grateful for this space to share with all of you. Um, I, I think it's interesting that we, we approach this time on Veterans Day, uh, and as a veteran, one of the things I think about is how easy it is uh, particularly in 2020, with so many distractions, to almost, um, almost forget the plight of our military and those who are serving both here and abroad. So 
I wanted to focus our attention by way of prayer to consider our military. And if you would lend me your ears, it will honor me even as a veteran having served. Um, and I won't mind telling you that um, having served the last 10 years as a chaplain, 34 years total time, uh, the last 10 years as a chaplain, I have been able to relate even more deeply with those who are experiencing those wounds that we often don't see. So um, I think the best way to honor all of our military in this time where some are serving and many may not even know that they are away from home, may not know that they're um, in theaters of operation uh, to honor them by way of our prayers. So I invite you to join me. God, we pray now for all of our service members, and I particularly want to pray in certain areas. We pray for their physical protection in this new paradigm when um, there are no front lines and everybody is at risk. God, we pray for their protection, not just their physical protection, but also, God, we pray for those who suffer as I said a moment ago, from invisible wounds, soul wounds, these wounds that are difficult to diagnose, these wounds that are difficult to overcome, these wounds which may often lead to homelessness and um, different difficulties with their families. God, we pray for those who are suffering from these wounds even today. And those who are not, we pray for their physical protection. And God, we also pray for their, their emotional protection. Give these men and women who serve the ability to process what they see, to process and understand what they experience. My prayer is that you would hide their hearts, that you would keep their minds. And not just that, God, I pray for their spiritual protection. I know I can attest and I, I understand that even for those of us who, who are believers, Experiencing war can shake even the strongest of us. It can be unbearable to reconcile you as the God who we know with the God who allows war to exist. So God, we pray for their spiritual protection, protect them, strengthen all of those who serve. And in doing so, Lord, we pray for each of their, not only their protection, but for their homecoming. And I'm not just talking about their coming home to an address, not just coming home to a street, to a house, an apartment, some home, not just coming home to family, but coming home can be the hardest part of serving in the military. Moving from life on a battlefield, life at war to life at home, God can be daunting and it requires major adjustments, physical adjustments, mental adjustments, emotional adjustments, and yes, even spiritual adjustments. So we pray for their homecoming, that they would come home with all of their beings. Keep their minds, keep their hearts. Lastly, and equally as important, God, we pray for their strength, their strength now, as well as their keeping strength. Uh, we, we know that those who are serving often serve multiple capacities, multiple deployments, and going back can seem harder than going the first time. So God, while we have our men and women who are serving in the military, and they, they may know what to is expect cognitively, but struggle in their hearts, struggle in their minds. They struggle with the emotional toil and and the damage that it causes, those spiritual wounds, and they become sensitive, some become greatly damaged. So God, we pray now, we raise our prayers on behalf of all those who are serving in the military. And we remember God that you are moved by the prayers of the righteous. We remember God that there's power in prayer. And God, we remember that there's power in the number of those who are praying. This, oh God, is why we lift our men and women who are serving today. We lift them before you. 
knowing, believing, and understanding that you're able to do far exceeding abundantly above more than we could ask or think according to the power that lies not within Mike Yoder, not within Chris Ferguson, not within Garrett Nyland, not within Jim Freeman, not within Sarah Rambo, not within Eric Jackson, but the power that lies within you. And God, for this, we thank you and we bless you. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much, Eric. I really appreciate that. And of course, thank you for your service as well. 34 years providing that spiritual nurture to our men and women on the front lines. We're, we're really, really grateful. Well, as we get going, I want to take a few minutes to go over a few logistics. Um, a lot, a number of you have been with us before, but we, we have a, quite a few first timers each evening. So we got to do this each time. And the first thing we want to do is thank our generous sponsors. So we're going to put the slide up that uh, we had a, up a few minutes ago, but just before we were started. And uh, we want to you to see that uh, we're very grateful for our lead sponsors. If we can get that slide up, which is multi, which who are Multicare and Humana. They're always really generous supporters. And we also have support from Brown and Brown and Molina, United Healthcare, Financial Insights, DeVita, and Temple Bethel. You know, it's just so encouraging. There they are. It's so encouraging when local businesses step up and invest in our ability to continue our work in the community. And so we just extend our grateful appreciation once again to each of them that have provided a, a major amount of underwriting support for this week. Well, as our board chair, Chris mentioned, normally we'd be sitting around tables and we would have been able to introduce ourselves to each other in person, but here we are in our new reality of Zoom meetings. And so we're gonna ask you to do that now by using the chat window. So right now, would you type in your name and what city you're joining us from this afternoon? You may actually recognize the names of a few friends uh, in these chat messages as they flash past. And uh, we're gonna give you an opportunity at the end to stay after and to, to greet some of the folks you, you see on the screen, whose names you see or whose little tile pictures you see. Somehow, Somehow my microphone muted, sorry. I want you to know that the chat window is also uh, uh, there for you to use to ask questions. We're gonna have uh, some presentations and uh, you may hear something during one of those presentations that prompts you to ask a question. We're gonna probably have just a few minutes for a couple of questions. Unfortunately, this uh, isn't as much of a Q and A session as we'd like it to be, but we might have a couple of questions that we can deal with. So go ahead and put those in the chat window as well. So just type them up. I'll be watching that and we'll ask our speakers uh, some of the things that are on your mind if you uh, will put it in there. I did wanna say, I hope you're probably noticing that we're keeping your audio muted during most of the meeting. This is gonna allow us to stay focused on our presenters without any background noise distractions. Um, I just wanna reassure you that's nothing personal. Everyone is muted except the speakers. So, uh, we, but like I said, we'll we'll unmute you at the end so you can chat if you want to. Well, to kick it off, we're going to take a poll. It's the first of several that we're planning to do this afternoon, and uh, uh, that helps you know when we're in a setting like this just to be a little bit more interactive. Um, this isn't as easy to do when you're in a big banquet hall. So let's take advantage of the fact that we have to meet here together on Zoom this year and we can we can do some unique things uh, because we're here together on Zoom and one of them is to take a poll. So this first one will be a little bit of a fun one. You know, we mentioned that, we, that we're really, uh, we regret not being able to be together and that uh, we don't see you in person. And of course we can't feed you breakfast like we normally do each year. And unfortunately that means yes, you're on your own this year for food. Uh, for this if this evening, but we would we thought it would be fun to check in to get an idea of what everyone's meal plans are for this evening. So we're going to put up a poll and we're going to ask you to pick one of the three responses. Did you eat before you joined this meeting? If so, click that little box. 
Uh, are you going to wait till after this meeting is over and then grab something to eat? There's a uh, option at the end or there in the middle. If you'd be so brave as to uh, to let us know, no shame. Uh, are you going to eat during this meeting? That's totally fine. Click that box. So pick one of those three, hit the submit button, and then we'll just get a little bit of an idea of uh, what everybody's doing for meal plans tonight. And that's a little bit of practice in taking our first poll. So click one of those three options, hit submit, and we're going to bring the compiled answers up now and see what you're doing for dinner tonight. Oh, yeah, this has been pretty consistent all week that people are eating afterwards. But interestingly, tonight only 6% are eating during the meeting. It was it was double that last night. So um, uh, I'm not quite sure people are more satiated tonight. I guess they can hold off. So uh, you can uh, uh, see how that's gonna work. We'll do a couple more polls later. Well, we're gonna jump into the heart of our program tonight. And uh, that's going to be with our first presenter, Garrett Nyland. And, um, He's a genius with statistics and just really helping understand the big picture sense of what's happening with homelessness in our community. He actually co-chairs the Tacoma Pierce County Coalition to End Homelessness. And some new facts, if you uh, have been on listening to Garrett's presentations, he's done a brand new presentation each night. He has a third brand new one tonight. And uh, so we thought we, and he's gonna talk about veteran homelessness, obviously our focus for this evening. and. And uh, we thought it'd be interesting for you to know that while he was with Catholic Community Services, he worked extensively with the veteran programs in Pierce County. And most recently he was uh, on Pierce County's Ending Veterans Homelessness Task Force. So he, he knows of which he speaks tonight. In addition to his many volunteer roles, um, Garrett enjoys any activity where you get to create things. And I'm not surprised to hear that. It's like cooking, construction, model trains, and gardening are at the top of his list. And, you know, last but not least, he let me know that he spent six years as a combat medic in the National Guard. So how about that? So Garrett, thank you so much for being here again tonight and uh, give, kept telling us more of what we need to know about veteran homelessness and take it away, Mr. Nyland. Thank you, Mr. Yoder. Veterans are a really interesting population that we serve in homelessness. They come with some really unique needs and they come with um, some extra resources. So we're gonna talk about those a little bit. One of the nice things that the Veterans Administration does, and you don't hear that phrase very often, the Veterans Administration gets a bit of a bad rap, but they do a pretty impressive job around homeless veterans. Their goal, is to have no homeless veterans. And a group of agencies that work on homelessness called the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, USICH, put together four benchmarks that are used to help communities end veteran homelessness. So um, I'm gonna put up some of these charts. They're designed for internal veteran use only, but I thought I'd throw them up anyway so you'd know that we put all kinds of things on pages around homeless veterans. But a couple of the interesting benchmarks, one of them is how long it takes from when we know a veteran is homeless until we've housed them permanently, All right, We keep track of that. Um, the grantees are, um, are evaluated on how well they do it. Currently, the we takes about 160 days for the veterans we're able to house to get them into permanent housing from when we know they became homeless. That's a long time. Our goal is less than 90 days. And again, our goal is to have what's called um, functional zero. So you can't ever get rid of every person becoming homeless because of all the drivers of homelessness. But the idea is with functional zero, when a veteran becomes homeless, they immediately get access to emergency shelter. They immediately get access to a permanent housing program that um, fits their needs. And permanent housing is the obsession of the Veterans Administration. People need to be in their, their, you know, their, their home, home, not temporary anywhere. Um, another statistic that's really important here is on the bottom left, benchmark C. And that is, we look at over the last 90 days, how many veterans started a new episode of homelessness, right, became homeless. And that's 76 over the last 90 days. And how many veterans exited homelessness to permanent housing? And that's only 18. And that's pretty frustrating. And that shows that we don't have enough resources for the flow in in our community. This is a super busy 
visualization here. Again, this is something that's looked at by the veteran um, group that meets every week to talk about and, and kind of connect veterans with housing programs when there's availability in them. Um, but it tells a little bit about this upper left chart here shows the number of homeless veterans in Pierce County. And it usually hovers around 450. And this number is really accurate. Kind of goes up and down depending on, um, well, anyway, it's been going up over time, probably not because we have these massive growth in homelessness, but because we do a much better job year after year of identifying homeless veterans and knowing who we need to serve. And I also, we also remove people from the list constantly. So we um, pay attention. We look when they're in shelters, when they exit homeless programs into housing, we call them every two weeks, we email, we text, we track them down on Facebook, we reach out with the various arms of homeless outreach in the community. And so this is a really good number. And it's much higher than you're going to see in the point in time count, because we have lots more tools than just bumping into them on one day when point in time count happens. Um, this is super accurate and super depressing. So I'm going to jump next to information about veterans in Pierce County. We have a lot of veterans in Pierce County, and you can just make one guess as to why, because Pierce County is amazing, right? Um, and Washington's amazing. Not only is it Veterans Day today, it's also Washington State's birthday. Good to keep that in mind. Um, and a lot of veterans are attracted here. And so we have more veterans exit the military in Pierce County than pretty much from any other base, Joint Base lewis mccord in the U.S. Um, about 12% of our veterans are, are adults in Pierce County are veterans. That's not quite as many veterans as King County has, but we're growing veterans um, and King County's slowly losing veterans, mostly because it's expensive to be in King County and King County veterans are mostly Vietnam era veterans, which are getting in their 70s and 80s. The 78 year old Vietnam veteran that lives in my house will hopefully be alive a long time, but he's, he's doing better than the average at this point for veterans. And um, so we have a lot of Afghanistan, Iraq, Gulf War veterans in Pierce County. And so we suspect we're gonna grow to be the largest veteran county in Pierce County. And curiously, our veterans have a lot more disabilities than the average person, but also more disabilities than the average veteran. And you combine that with the low housing stock in Pierce County, and you can see why we have very high veteran homelessness. Luckily, we have a lot of resources, although they're not all getting used as well as we'd like. So Pierce County Council put together a task force last year uh, made up of all the major veteran providers and some other folks that work in this arena. And the goal was to end veteran homelessness. They had some more resources to throw in. And this is a chart made, um, I didn't do that blue stuff. This is a chart made by um, Sean Dennerlin with the Pierce County Veterans Bureau. And it it's, all these little gray boxes, anyway, this is like way more information than you can see, but all the gray boxes are a way that veterans get served in homelessness. That's a lot. And the goal was to find where the bottlenecks are, where we're failing our veterans, and to figure out how to fix it. And so that work um, produced some recommendations, which got all screwed up when COVID-19 happened, but we're hoping to jump back on that again. And some of the things we noticed were that we need to use our HUD-VASH vouchers better. Those are Section 8 vouchers. So are chronically homeless, right? Folks with disability, long-term homeless, um, they get a magic uh, golden ticket, right? Basically subsidized housing the rest of their lives. But we have 100 plus of these vouchers that are allocated to veterans, but the veterans can't find any, um, any landlord willing to rent to them. So we're working hard and trying to, you know, get um, more resources to like associated ministries, amazing landlord liaison programs so that that can be a resource so we can better use these vouchers. So once we've used them, we can get more vouchers. And the same thing with SSVF. Luckily, the Veterans Administration really, again, focuses on best practices around homelessness. And um, they kind of led the way with rapid rehousing. They made it kind of a national standard because it's so effective. And, and they actually look at other what other people are doing across the nation to find effective programs. So Associated Ministries has been doing diversion, right? That's this one-time assistance when you first become homeless for a long time. Veterans Administration noticed programs like that, asked Pierce County how it was working, and they've actually taken the model that Associated Ministries does, and they are deploying it, they call it rapid resolution, across the entire country. 
Um, but we need more resources. We need more shelter. There's not enough shelter for veterans experiencing homelessness. And um, what we don't need also, though, is to build programs for the veterans we want to serve. The bottom picture here is Betsy Ross House. This was a bad idea. Um, this is something that often happens where people see veterans they like. In this case, somebody said, oh, wouldn't it be great to build housing, temporary housing for women that don't have any children that are veterans that are, you know, stable and not using any substances and are really stable with their mental health, right? Wouldn't that be a great program? Turns out, no, especially if you base it in ording. So this is a great example of what we shouldn't be doing as we serve people by making a program around the people we wanna serve. We should be like Associated Ministries and design our programs around the people that show up at our front door. So I could talk forever about veterans and homelessness, but I already took too much time. You can ask me questions anytime at pchomeless.org and um, I'll put my contact information in the chat. Awesome, Garrett, as usual. We always learn so much from you, and there's uh, there's a lot of details there with the, with the uh, veteran situation. So I don't know if anyone uh, wanted Garrett to expand on any of those little stats. Some of them were a little hard to see, but I would think they were there, you know, more for the principle of showing the work that's being done to coordinate our veteran systems. It's I find it uh, uh, I find it encouraging to know that we're taking these extra efforts uh, to to look at our veteran homeless situation to 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 take that the, the Veterans Administration is actually working so hard to, uh, to to look at best practices and roll them out and that they even found some here in Pierce County and have rolled them out and that uh, our Pierce County Council has taken this extra step and Garrett was involved in that and just uh, doing what we can do to make sure there are fewer and fewer cracks for our veterans to fall through. And we need to do that for them. We, we deserve them. So um, we've got a question about how veteran homelessness overlaps with chronic homelessness. Do you do, you have, do, you do statistics of those who are classified as chronically homeless to see how many of them are veterans? Yeah, so um, right now it's about 115. Um, in veteran land, we, we put two together. So chronic homeless means you're homeless a long time and you have a disability. And in veteran land, we also lump in anybody that's been homeless a long time, right? So we treat those two together. So we call it um, chronic and long-term homeless. Um, nationwide, it's about 25%. Um, and it's a, little bit, uh, it's a little bit lower than that statistically in Pierce County, but, um, but not much. Okay. We are going to move along. And uh, as you know, some of you have been with us in previous evenings, we have some kind of a, of a, of a local community expert, someone who's kind of on the ground doing the work that we're focusing on and highlighting. And tonight there's just um, someone who's not the typical human services, social services provider, executive director of a nonprofit uh, like I've had on the last couple of nights. This is just a gentleman that I have just gotten to uh, appreciate so much by serving together with him on the board of the, uh, the Tacoma Pierce County Affordable Housing Consortium and have just learned by just hanging out with him and being a fellow board member of, of just his genuine passion for veteran homelessness. And I said, you know what, I'm going to ask him to speak tonight and add uh, some of that uh, uh, you know, reality to, the, to what's happening with veteran homeless. So I'm going to ask Brian Michael to share now. And his way of introduction, he's uh, uh, got a little bit of a different bio than many of the others that we've had on this week. Um, he's been in banking for 30 years, and he currently works for US Bank as a district manager. So originally he was born in rural Indiana and he did his undergraduate work at Purdue, then joined the army and he finished his graduate work in St. Louis. And uh, through his life experience, he's just become a really strong advocate for veterans issues. And he's been on the board for many organizations, including the Veterans Association of Real Estate Professionals and the Tacoma Pierce County Affordable Housing Consortium, as I mentioned. He really enjoys his family, including his daughter who's doing her PhD D work at the University of Wisconsin and son who is an undergrad at USC. He says he enjoys the outdoors and going backpacking, which it doesn't surprise me in the least. So Brian, 
tell us a little bit more of the reality of what you see from your passion and your experience working with homeless veterans. Hopefully he is gonna be able to connect now. He had some connection problems earlier. I hope Brian, oop. Looks like Brian should be here in his iPhone, but we can't hear you, Brian. Still no volume from Brian. Give him another minute here. He texted me right as we were starting saying he was having connection issues, which is always the worst. It appears his phone is connected and it is not muted. So I'm not quite sure. Um, Sandy and Michelle, are we sure he's specifically unmuted as speaker? Yes, he is unmuted. Okay. We'll try this again. Well, that is unfortunate. I think, Brian, I'm gonna ask you to keep working on trying to, uh, to see if you can get connected and get audio going. And in the meantime, what we'll do is our poll and we have another uh, community advocate that we can hear from and uh, maybe we'll have a chance to loop back with Brian. Let me, I'm gonna keep my phone out in case he wants to send me a, a text or a message or anything like that. Um, yeah, okay, so he just said he did call in. He's on Zoom. Okay, well, well, hopefully it's, he's supposed to be joining us on Zoom. In the meantime, let's go to the poll. Each night we've been kind of getting a little feel from our audience. We have 47 uh, computers logged in tonight. As we've mentioned, there's uh, some couples and multiple people on each one. So, you know, there's maybe 60 or more of us tonight uh, together in this room. And so this is by no way scientific, but uh, we always like to hear what our guests are on our meeting are thinking about the issue that we're talking about. So we're, we're talking about uh, veteran homelessness tonight, and there's uh, uh, several significant factors that have been identified that lead to veteran homelessness. So we're gonna put that poll up right now and ask you to vote. Uh, this isn't, this isn't uh, out of your expertise, this is just out of your heart and your feelings. Which do you believe, um, uh, which of these issues do you believe um, is the most compelling issue related to veteran homelessness that we should be addressing here in Pierce County. And uh, that's living below the poverty line. Um, that is uh, post-traumatic stress and other disabilities and lack of support from family and friends that social isolation. Those are three identified major factors that relate to veteran homelessness. And so just, Take a quick look at those. Give us an idea um, of what you think might be uh, something we should be aware of and be thinking about to, to address here in Pierce County. Go ahead and vote and we're gonna close the poll here in just a minute. Let's take a look at what you're thinking. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Post-traumatic stress. I mean, I just think it's 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 got to you know obviously poverty and supports are affecting you know are are effects for everyone that's related to homelessness. But uh, while our veterans have that unique challenge of their post-traumatic stress and other disabilities that we always need to be mindful for when we are working with veterans. So Brian, um, any chance that you are able to speak now? Try your volume and let us know if we can hear you. He sent me an email that he's on and his picture's there and he can see us, but some reason he remains muted. So I'm not quite sure what the issue is. 
So we'll go on to our community partner and uh, hear a little bit from her and we'll give Brian one more chance. We can loop back in and see if we can hear from him because I just really want you to hear from his heart and the work that he does. So I sure hope we can get him connected. Um, but let's go to let's go to Narinda. And uh, each evening we've also had someone on that I've just really appreciated getting to know just because of their role in this community, just working with people who are hey, vulnerable. Michael? Yeah. Hey, Brian. Hey. Oh my gosh, look at that. He's he's joining us from some village in this in uh, in Europe yeah, somewhere. Maybe yeah, that's the Amalfi connection. Coast. Yeah, the Amalfi Coast. Okay, there you go. Hey, before we go to Narinda then, Narinda, you'll, we'll put you on pause. And now we'll, while we have Brian, we're going to grab him and uh, take a couple of minutes and, uh, and share with us what you have to uh, let us know about. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, that's always uh, our lovely new world. I had uploaded uh, a new iOS last night, which uh, uh, yes. is not a good thing to do the day before you're planning on getting on a meeting. Everyone remember that. So uh, again, I apologize, uh, but I do appreciate the opportunity and I will shave a little bit off of this for all the time that I uh, was missing. So as Michael said, I, I'm here more for, let's say the color commentary. We have uh, plenty of facts and opinions, uh, or not opinions, but facts and, and things of that nature. I will sit, share a couple that are very dear to me, um, not in a positive way, unfortunately, but they're ones that really hit uh, hard. And uh, the first one that I'll share is that one of the statistics that is being thrown out there, and it doesn't matter if it's exactly true or not, but they're saying up to 80% of veteran homeless uh, have some type of either drug dependency or mental health problem or both. So that leads to a lot of the issues and compounds, um, a lot of the problems trying to work through. There's a lot of advantages that the veterans have access to a lot more opportunities uh, to try to help. There's a lot of specific things set up for them, but unfortunately, because of the nature, um, that's not always the easiest thing to do. And the other stat that we run is, excuse me, but we have 22 veteran suicides a day, every day, day after day. And that's just something that we all have to work with, get better on. We do our buddy checks as much as we can, but if somebody is determined, unfortunately, that's part of what we're taught in being in the military is that we are taught to succeed when we put our mind to something. And so that's something that we also deal with on a daily basis. So. So with that, I thought I'd share a little bit of why this is a little bit unique as far as, you know, what the people that we're dealing with, if you, and to try to help kind of understand maybe a little bit. And so one of the things um, that we're talking about, human beings aren't meant for combat. I mean, they're just not built to, to, to do that. And historically, what we've done is we've separated those people. We, we've made them professionals, we've made them permanent, and we segregate them from the populace because we have to, to be honest. And that's not the case anymore. So in our modern world, we have guys that we sit around and gals, sorry, I don't mean to use that, but we have people and we flood them with adrenaline situations and then we put them in long periods of absolute boredom and monotony. And then we put them back into situations that require an amount, I mean, just a natural amount of adrenaline. So you spend most of your time wanting to be back in the world. But then when you get back to the world, you realize that you don't know how to fit in anymore. So that unique situation leads to many, many problems. And a good part of that is, is nonsense, to be honest, it, it, your ability to deal with things that really don't matter. And our world is so full of them that when you talk about all you have to do is, is go and sign up for these benefits and you'd have them. Um, but 
when it's you stand in line and you're waiting, um, you know, your mind gets doing different things. So what I'd ask is just uh, some patience um, because that is a very difficult thing for people to handle um, it, when you're in that situation. The other part is the isolation. So we bring them back and we put them and then, you know, if they do get housed and now we're putting them by themselves in a room to just deal with their demons, you need some time and alone, but you also need time together. But the time together really needs to be with people that understand you. Um, and if you're putting them in an apartment out in the middle of nowhere with no resources or, you, you know, they do have them, but they don't use them where are you going to go to find somebody? Well, they're going to bars, you know, you're going to whatever the common place is to find contact. Well, once you get there, then we're adding another layer that's not healthy. And then we're starting to think about all the people that aren't around us. And then we're starting to see the people that didn't pay like your buddies did. And then you're angry. And then that's a really wonderful situation, right? So how, that's going to end well. So there's just a lot of things like that that we don't consider sometimes because it's not the norm when the isolation that comes sometimes where it should be a good situation of having housing, but instead it becomes something that's a negative because of the isolation that it can cause. So the support is always one of the main things that need to be done there. And I would say the last thing that becomes really, really difficult is you have such responsibility, meaning the, the veteran in the army or in, the, in any of the services, you're trusted with so much and your everybody depends on you. I mean, in your unit, we all have to depend on each other. So you have so much responsibility and let alone with equipment and, and with service and all the things that they allow you to do or expect you to do. And then you come back and you're in, and you know, you can't keep a job because, you know, people don't trust you with anything. So now your self-esteem also then becomes under, in effect, you know, is affected by that. So that you're sitting with guys in one moment and, it's the most important thing in the world and you don't think it'll ever end. And then the next thing you know, you're by yourself somewhere and you have no idea how did you got there and how to get out of it. So that's just some perspective as far as I just wanted to provide a little bit, maybe to help understand that what it's like. So maybe the next time you guys bless you all on here, I know how much great work you do, but maybe next time you're getting frustrated with one of those veterans Maybe what I said today, you'll kind of give them just a little bit of slack and not a lot. They need order. Don't get me wrong on this. We can't just roll over because they don't appreciate that either. We got to hold people accountable. That's absolutely you know paramount, but patience can go a long way. Ryan, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I'm sure everybody on this uh on this meeting room tonight can see why I ask Brian. I mean, I, I've sat next to this man for years in board meetings and I have personally experienced his passion for his fellow, fellow veterans. And we're just so grateful for you, for, for your service personally and your service to your fellow veterans as you continue to, uh, you know, to show up for them here in the community. And we're just really grateful. Some really inspiring and thoughtful words tonight. Thank you for joining. I'm so glad we got the technology to work, but we got to move you. on quickly now to um, our last little presenter, Narinda Rosario Yancey. And she is uh, someone I've just really, really enjoyed getting to know in the past year. And uh, she serves uh, as the Vice President of Community Impact for United Way of Pierce County. Um, starting in January of this year, and I actually got to meet her during her final interview, but I don't think that had anything to do with her getting the job. But uh, <laughs> prior to prior to coming to the Pacific Northwest at the beginning of this year, she uh, served with United Way of North Central Florida in Gainesville. So she is from one corner to the other type of a person. Yep. 
and she's had a 25 year career advocating for children and families um, that began when she was participating in a summer youth employment program as a teenager. And she's continued in all kinds of roles over the years in both public and private uh, sectors. And I just think she's just, she's just one of the people that I, I, it's just such a beautiful addition to the fabric of our community. And, uh, you know, she's, uh, she's married, she says, to the man of her dreams. I would expect her to say that in her bio, because that's who Narinda is. She just says yeah. things like that. It's beautiful. She has three grown children, two grandchildren, and a dog named Kuma. So she's just yeah. after my own heart. <laughs> so Narinda, we just got a couple of minutes now. Really, I know this, this isn't about veterans. This is just widening to people in need in our community. Yeah. And uh, everything that you are involved in, you're new to this community. Tell us I about am. The power I am, of and you the power of partnership in Pierce County. Why do we need to work together? What's What have Amen. we got going in this community as a relative so, so outsider, you, a new person? You picked the long-winded talker from Philadelphia to go last with a little bit of time. So I'm gonna try to get right to it. Um, yes, I love this serendipitous occasion of meeting you in the lobby that day of my interview. Um, and you were a highlight of the day. We'll have to talk about that more. <laughs> Very stressful nailing this job. So I'm just exceptionally delighted to be given the opportunity to really highlight Associated Ministries for being an exemplary partner. You know, I went to my team and I said, I'm new. I just started in January. I know I think Mike is great. Um, I see it on paper. I know he's great, but you've got to tell me more. And so honestly, Penny Belcher and Sean Patton insisted that I say the following. And so you can blame them. <laughs> Essentially, our relationship organizationally began decades ago and Associated Ministries was absolutely instrumental in starting our United Way helpline, which included an embedded Associated Ministries staff person that helped us centralize information on shelter and homelessness prevention services long before anybody was talking about central intake. So that innovation, forward thinking, boldness, always there. Um, and, and Associated Ministries also stepped up to lead the Asset Building Coalition and the vital work, as well as took the lead in the centralized intake system as part of the fight to end homelessness. And they've also been active partners in our investment cohorts. Um, and to say that we're collaborators is really an extreme understatement. Our current efforts in coordinated entry include frequent daily communication between our 2-on-1 director and their program manager for coordinated entry. Together, they've created seamless service delivery that includes 2-on-1 doing the screening and appointment setting while Associated Ministries trains our staff uh, so they can learn how to offer individuals pathways for housing and provide that, provide that light case management to callers so we can effectively support and motivate clients in our housing diversion work. Um, also, because our focus is always on serving the community efficiently and effectively, this year we had another opportunity to partner with Associated Ministries to ensure that county flex dollars that were dedicated to housing families could be managed by Associated Ministries to fund that diversion work throughout the county, rather than those dollars sitting unused in one particular agency. And um, I'll just say I was a part of those conversation and, and uh, was tickled to death to see how that how that all played out. Again, a testament to being a really solid, solid partner. Um, and we at this United Way use the word partner very carefully. Um, so when we say that, we mean that in the truest sense of the word. Um, honestly, Mike, we could go on and on. I'm sure there's list of accomplishments, but um, we have a very highly valued relationship with you um, and your organization and under your leadership, so many wonderful things have, have really emerged. And we're looking forward to seeing how this ongoing partnership with your organization continues to grow in service to the Pierce County community. And we are humbled and we are appreciative um, and very, very grateful. Wow, Norinda, thank you. <laughs> Yes, my pleasure. Yeah, you, you, it's my you pleasure. people are probably wondering if I'm like doing some payoffs to some of these people to no, say what I they promise. are, but you know, it, it's a love fest. I, I appreciate you yeah. so much as well. So, and thank Absolutely. you. And I, and I think, you know, the reason that I, I asked Narinda to share is because I just think it's so powerful to highlight the power of partnerships. And, and I am telling you, you know, we cannot do this work alone. No one would even think of trying it in, in yeah. any of our organizations, but I want everyone else that's here uh, in this meeting room tonight to realize you don't have to work for a nonprofit like Narinda and I uh, and in 
and to make a difference in the lives of those in need. Everyone can do something. And in fact, I'm looking over the list of participants tonight and I see a lot of names in there, people that I know are doing some pretty amazing things in this community. Mike Boister, I see you, he is running. He is saving the world in, out in Puyallup and they need all the help they can get. I live out there, so I know it. We're just grateful for people like you, Mike. Richard Berghammer, who just is in a tireless advocate for the homeless um, uh, on the east side and throughout this whole community. Um, Brian and Anna Peterson, I see you guys. I wish I could call every one of you out, I know so many of you are doing so many things. It's just, it's just a beautiful thing to see the power of partnerships, but I do wanna now move into what we all can do together because that's what we really are here to, to really bring the bottom line is, is how do we really have some shared impact? And when we show up and come together, we really can do that. And AM is, is proud to have a leadership role in convening and deploying people of faith and goodwill to effectively serve the vulnerable. We've done that for 51 years. And currently we're involved in several key aspects of our county's homeless response efforts, including that we co-manage coordinated entry. That's been mentioned a few times. That includes the initial screening and the diversion conversations. We try to quickly solve someone's homelessness episode with a light touch and then a prioritization and a referral we do that for every homeless household in Pierce County, comes through our coordinated entry program that we co-manage. We also have a major rapid rehousing effort, and that's an effort to walk alongside families as they seek and move into permanent housing. And we would have one of the largest efforts uh, that's doing that work in Pierce County. We also run the Landlord Liaison Program. And that's a program that incentivizes the private market landlords to lower barriers for our clients coming out of the homeless system. And then there's Project Homeless Connect, which is our resource fairs that we do several times a year to bring the community together to serve those experiencing homelessness. And of course, many of you know about Paint Tacoma Beautiful, 36 year long program, the volunteer income tax program that Narinda mentioned, so many others. And then, you know, AM also convenes congregations and other nonprofits to help them fulfill their own unique roles in addressing homelessness. And, Finally, we continue to embrace the role we've had over all these decades to advocate for systems change, including convening a moral voice advocacy group and our newest effort to confront systemic racism and dismantle, and dismantle its impact in the homeless and housing system of Pierce County. We're pressing into that like never before. So, you know, our community really depends on AM to be there and to be effective. And, we need partners to stand with us, to enable us to stay strong. You know, I think no one would ever believe they could do this work alone. We know we can't, but together, we really believe there's nothing we can't do. So now we're gonna invite each of you to join us in sustaining and advancing this work. And to do that, I'd like to introduce Sarah Rumbaugh. She's the president elect of the Associated Ministries Board of Directors and also serves on the board at her congregation, Temple Bethel. She's also in the city of Tacoma's Human Rights Commission. And um, she has her own consulting business now, a master's degree in environmental studies. She lives in Northeast Tacoma with her husband, Stan, who many of you know as an esteemed Pierce County Superior Court judge. Sarah just completed uh, a run for Pierce County Council, almost successful, but not quite, but she did an amazing job running for the council seat out in my area of Puyallup. And among the issues that she championed and brought to light in beautiful new ways is the need for more behavioral health resources and affordable housing. And through all that work, she's become a passionate voice for social justice issues in our community now. So we're so pleased that Sarah's on our board. And over to you, Sarah, just to tell us how we all can partner to advance this work. Well, I want to thank you for that warm welcome, Mike. And many of you have already heard me speak um, this week, and I have the same speech I'm going to give. But I want to I want to compel you. Um, if you've already, the way that you can support us is by being a part of our financial backing by making a contribution tonight. Many of you may have already made a contribution, and many of you be, might have made gifts throughout the whole year, and I want to thank you for being a part of our partnership. We wouldn't be able to do this great work if it wasn't for you. Uh, again, my name is Sarah Rumba, and I am the 
and um, on the board of directors for Associated Ministry as the president elect. And this is the time when I get to challenge you to make an investment in AM's ability to continue our essential work of meeting vital needs and convening and deploying community partners into compassionate and equitable service. Right up front, I want you to know that I would not ask you to do something I wasn't willing to do myself. I have personally been involved in supporting AM, volunteering on the board and making financial contributions for several years. And my congregation, Temple Bethel, has been involved for years in the homeless issue and as a sponsor for AM's annual fundraising event. That's how I got, um, got involved in AM was because of the homeless issue and our temple took on a strong role in that and that's why I'm here today. This afternoon, we've attempted to educate you about the needs and inspire you to believe that every one of us can be involved in meeting them. The consequences of inaction are too great. The future of those without shelter is too fragile. The work of AM is too essential for any one of us to sit on the sidelines. So I invite you to join us by making a financial gift online right now. And I know that Michelle put it into the chat. That's one of the ways that you can make a contribution. You can also um, make a contribution after tonight by going online to our website. And um, just so you know, uh, so just so you know specifically, how will your gift help? Um, a donation of $74 will fund two weeks of a caseworker's compassionate care, walking alongside a family in need. A gift of $192 will underwrite an AM staff member's work to find permanent housing for a family. Or a gift of $448 will provide the average monthly rental assistance that a family needs to stay in permanent housing. Um, and then if you are so inclined, a gift of $2,398 um, is the average amount required to st stabilize a family and enable them to move their lives forward in permanent housing, which is we want what we want for everyone in Pierce County because everyone deserves a home. AM has stepped up during the pandemic in some unprecedented ways, and we're eager to, eager to continue our momentum of doing new things in new ways. So this evening, I implore you, will you join us in our mission of working together toward lasting solutions to homelessness, this is our only fundraising event of the year, so we're really hopeful you'll respond tonight. And thank you so much for your investment in the essential work of Associated Ministries. Thanks very much, Sarah. We, uh, we do appreciate your inspiring words and we do take them to heart. From the bottom of my heart, I thank all of you present for joining us this evening. And, I, and in this, I speak for the entire Associated Ministries Board of Directors. And that would be Sarah Rambaugh, Temple Bethel, Mary Lobdell Anderson, St. Patrick Catholic Church, Eric Jackson, former senior pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church and retired army chaplain who you've heard from uh, this evening uh, as well. Uh, Martha Ward, St. Mark Lutheran Church by the Narrows, Jim Friedman, Temple Bethel, Karen Olison, Baha'i Faith Community of Tacoma, Kelly Blucher, community activist. Brendan Nelson, Peace Lutheran Church of Tacoma, Craig Hewish, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Tacoma, and Ron Martinez, Harbor Christian Church. I want to thank uh, at this point the AM staff members who came together and served on our Focus Week planning committee, especially Michelle Cotton and Sandy Windley, and thank you everyone for bringing your compassion with you this evening. It's, it's truly the tie that binds us to one another, isn't it? And with all those whom we serve through Associated Ministries programs and services, uh, we need to be wearing our compassion as much as we possibly can these days. So now we're going to unmute the microphones for any of you who wanna stay after for a few minutes to greet one another. Otherwise, uh, please feel free to log off now if you'd like, but, but go with our deep gratitude for your attendance. Uh, please do join us again tomorrow for our remaining Focus Week event. Mm -hmm. I promise that you'll learn something new if you come back. You'll see some new speakers, hear some new insights on homelessness, and um, uh, share in uh, uh, this journey uh, to ending homelessness in Tacoma. Mm -hmm. So thanks, everyone, and uh, good evening. Thank you all so much for being